Hello, I'm Susan Cole. And I'm Matthew Hodson. And welcome to AIDS Map Chat, our live show bringing you news about HIV for people all around the globe. We have another completely superb lineup of guests for you tonight. We have one of the most esteemed HIV clinicians in the whole world. Her name's Professor Jane Anderson. Uh, we also have, from Kenya, we have Florence Anan, who is uh, part of the global network of people living with HIV. And we have writer and activist Mark S. King. What a tremendous lineup we have this week. I'm, I'm very, very excited. And I'm also kind of excited and recovering from actually seeing you in the flesh. Oh, no. <laughs> Last week, Matthew. And Susan, lots of people. Susan and I were together with each other and with other colleagues uh, who work in HIV, uh, in, in clinicians and people who work for HIV charities and organisations in HIV support at the UK preview of the AIDS Memorial Quilt Exhibition, uh, which was incredible and it was so wonderful to see. I mean, how, how, did, you how, how did you find it all, Susan? I, I mean, it, I, it was incredibly emotional, um, but the display in itself is absolutely phenomenal. It's the largest display in the UK since 1994, um, I think when there was a display in Hyde Park, but there are so many large quilts brought together for the first time in in one place in, in such a long time. And it's incredible to have all of these lives memorized. And it's so important that we, we, we don't forget. And um, I would definitely encourage everyone to go. And also, if you're not able to, check out the film that we have made about it. Yeah. How did it make you feel? Well, so, so I, mean, I, I, I saw it in Hyde Park in uh, 1994, um, and I found it incredibly moving back then. I remember like walking around and just kind of being really sucked in by the stories it was telling. And I thought that maybe it would be different this time, because obviously I've been working in the HIV sector for 22 years now. And, you know, my whole life is about information about HIV and AIDS. And so I thought that maybe I would have built up some kind of armor, some kind of thicker skin about it. But actually, when I walked in uh, and saw the panels there in front of me, and you think about all the thought and all the care and all the grief that went into every stitch, and it just, just really hits you still. Um, it's it's incredibly profoundly moving it makes me so grateful that we are now able to treat hiv but it makes me grieve so much for all the lives that were taken from us yeah yeah Absolutely. um yeah. One of the people who was there and someone who, who knows about HIV from the very early days is our first guest, Professor Jane Anderson. Hello. Hi, Jane. Hello, Jane. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. No, it's a privilege to be asked. I'm delighted to be here. It's a great honour to have you here. Now, you spoke at, at, at the event last Friday and you said that you, you, you when you were training to be a doctor, you actually were training at St. Mary's in Paddington, which was one of the very first AIDS hospitals or hospitals hospitals that dealt with AIDS. And actually your first day as a doctor was on the AIDS wards. Mm. I mean, how, how how was it working the HIV wards back, back then? Well, it was a very complicated time because um, the structures weren't really in place. And so the professor of medicine, Professor Peart at St. Mary's sort of lent us out. So we were, uh, employed to work for the professor of medicine and he let us um, sort of moonlight if you like doing our house jobs for professor Tony Pinching who was looking after young men with AIDS um, so it was a really complicated time because there were always um, people coming in but the numbers weren't that high but they were very complicated because it was still the early days and trying to find out a lot of the time what was going on um, I suppose because it was my first job, 
uh, I hadn't quite known what to expect anyhow about what being a doctor was going to be like. Um, and so I went in, you know, with my eyes prepared for, you know, finding out what being a doctor was like. But I must say those first six months of my medical career, I saw things and heard stories and met people and was taught so much uh, that it shaped everything I think I've done since then. Although it wasn't really till afterwards I sort of looked back and realized how impactful it was. Um, but it was a very, very profound time. Wonderful. I mean, and we have made such incredible progress, Jane. Um, since then but do you think that we're really on track to end AIDS by 2030 and and what do we have to do to make that happen well it depends what you mean by we and i think the global we i i'm anxious even with the new un aid strategy i mean i think the level of inequalities and the work that's set out in that document wow um you know we've got We've had a marathon and we're in a bit now, which is the tough, tough bit and dealing with so many structural issues and health inequalities globally. But it seems to me that we've got a roadmap and some plans to take us five years forward, even if not, you know, to the 2030 time. And be, you know, I think it'd be really interesting to see how that works out and whether it galvanizes people, particularly as health inequalities have really had a light shone on them through COVID. And I think people are much more alert now than they were a year ago even. And I think the other thing that's happened is this sense that people sort of understand viruses a bit better. Um, people just talk about, oh, yeah, I have a lateral flow test and there's a variant and there's a mutant and there's a vaccine. So there's a literacy that seems to have emerged in the last year, which could be really helpful, actually, if we use it uh, and play it but i think globally it's a big ask but actually if you come down to sort of place based and you look a bit more you know closer to home well london we're doing really really well in london it's really it's incredibly exciting and looking at the lines on the curve you know it's a not quite the Chris Whitty, you know, next slide, please. But nonetheless, that graph from Health HIV um, uh, Public Health England, you know, showing that really steep fall and a paper that actually you showed last week in, uh, in NAM that we're on track and that actually by 2030, we could be down to 80 new infections a day. But that is around the infection rate in gay men. And I think that paper you showed us said, yep, it's quite possible, but not for all gay men because older gay men aren't having quite the same, you know, the drop that we're seeing. And then there's other people for whom we know that late diagnosis is really stuck. Uh, people, you know, women who haven't heard about PrEP yet. There's, a, there's another mountain in you know behind that graph so if we go for it i think we've got the opportunity and i think we've got the political will at the moment you know we've got a mayor in london who's very committed he's absolutely behind this um we did have a health secretary who was absolutely behind it uh, and if sajid javid is listening this is a bit of matt hancock's legacy that would be could you just please hang on to that and not mess with it thank you because we have got you know we've had a health minister who says he's going to do it and he's up for it so uh, with that political leadership the resource we've got uh, we're just going to keep on keeping on because we can get there because, I mean, I think one of the things which I find quite interesting about your career, Jane, is obviously you are a clinician, you're one of the top clinicians in the country, if not the world, um, but you also have moved increasingly into a policy arena. You're very influential in terms of health policy. H how do you marry those two elements of your work? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like a split to me, because if you start by assuming that the job of a doctor is to make sure people have the best possible health and that you're trained to try and put some of those things right. I think particularly in the field of HIV when so much of the ill health is associated with uh, 
you know, often being an outsider or not having the things you need or being having your rights denied. You know, it doesn't take long working in an HIV clinic to start talking very seriously about human rights, funding of things, uh, deportation, asylum, citizenship. Um, and if you're going to put those things into the mix, then you have to be political. And as soon as people start prioritizing what they're going to spend government money on, you have to make the arguments. And I, I think it hasn't been, uh, for me, that much of a, of a stretch. And I think probably working as I have in East London, um, certainly in the, you know, there was a time when the detention centers were deporting people. And, you know, I'd have a patient, I remember very clearly there was a woman who, she was pregnant with twins, she was very unwell, she had high blood pressure, and she rang me and she said, I'm on a bus and they're taking me, uh, they're taking me away. And you think, no, 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 excuse me, you can't do that. That is not, you can't do those things. So it makes, you know, that level of engagement when your patients are being messed about with uh, made me very angry and that led me into that. The other thing that happened was I was influenced, I think, um, by a completely wonderful person called Yusuf Azad, who many of us will know in the sector. And when he was at National AIDS Trust and I was at the British HIV Association, he was incredibly supportive and helpful when I was trying to do things to try and make people's health better. And he also taught me the times when doctors political intervention was useful and he'd say well this one you're you're not going to win that one don't put your energy there but if a doctor were to speak to that issue that would make a difference so i had tutorials from a master uh in in hiv policy and i think he showed me some things that we could make a difference about thank you thank you so much jane so great to have you on the show thank you Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you for having me. Okay. Well, I, one of the things that Jane said on, on Friday, and I, it felt it really resonated. Well, lots of what she said resonated. One, she did say health is political. Health is always political. And obviously, you know, what she's just been sharing with us you know, really backs that up. But the other thing she said is, We've kind of got to think about how we're going to be remembered. You know, we were there at the AIDS Memorial Quilt and we were thinking about memory and about how people are remembered. And she said, let's make sure that we are remembered as the generation that stepped up and ended HIV. And I think that's so powerful. I always find Jane really powerful. Let's bring our next guest on. Our next guest, hi, Florence Anam. How are you? I'm fine. Hi. How are you? Yeah, we're good. Lovely to have you on all the way in Kenya. Florence. Thank you so much for having me. And it's always a delight um, to have someone from the global network of people living with HIV. Thank you so much for all of the really important work that you do. But um, I wanted to ask you, I mean, Jane touched briefly on the high level meeting uh, on AIDS. And we, we do now have this declaration, a political declaration. So they looked at the progress that we've made so far and what needs to happen next. Um, and there's lots and lots in that declaration, but what in particular do you find is, uh, is most important? I think this declaration um, is, is progressive. There's lots of things from um, this particular declaration that were not in the 2016 declaration. For example, you have clear um, instructions or rather clear guidance on you know, targets around how to address social enablers that are aligned, of course, to the global um, aid strategy, addressing stigma, addressing violence, addressing gender-based violence. That is very clear compared to what we had in 2016. We have language that will really help in reducing stigma. For example, for a first time in, in a declaration document, 
the adoption of the of the word of the the GIPA principle is actually there. The greater involvement of people living with HIV it's never happened before. We have the concept and principle of undetectable equals untransmittable, which will be useful in, 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 in you know, ensuring that we change the narrative around people living with HIV being just about risk, but also motivating people living with HIV to, you know, seek testing and treatment and remain adherent to be able to not infect someone else. There's lots of um, progressive language. There's definitely things we would have wished to see, like clarity on issues on sexual and reproductive health and rights that we lost um, last minute, to be honest, and aspects around um, comprehensive sexuality education that also we would have loved to see being very clear in this document, but we're not there. But ultimately, there's, there's a lot that community can do to, to, take, to take this forward, yeah. Fantastic. Um, you, you mentioned gender-based violence. I've heard that during lockdown in some countries, gender-based violence has increased by up to 500%. Um, women with HIV, you know, we are disproportionately affected by gender-based violence. Um, what, what are you hearing that's happening now? I think... If, if you look at the start of, of the COVID-19 epidemic and some of the, you know, I mean, it was last year, to be honest, around March, everyone was in panic. We weren't knowing what's coming, but something was coming. And so government in that panic also constitu instituted very harsh lockdowns. And these lockdowns put particularly women in a very difficult situation because everybody then had to go back home and sit within environments that sometimes they could be able to get out of if let's say girls get to go to school and women get to go to work and all these things got shut down. And so women were sort of boxed within houses or units with their abusers. And also because of the frustration, gender-based violence is in existence everywhere and higher for, 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 for people in Africa, but also for women living with HIV. But then it became doubled. With, with the pressures, with the cell of illicit, because again, for I was in South Africa at the time and, and alcohol was actually not being sold, but then that opens room for illicit trade and, and you know, things that are not good. So people still drank and people still then engaged in, in violence. I remember the first two weeks, there was report on the hotline, the, the gender-based violence hotline in South Africa of about 87,000 cases in one week. And only 2,000 were able to be addressed by the police. So even the system is not, you know, or rather was not well equipped to respond to all the cases that were reported. And we saw that increasingly in different countries. We are seeing over time um, President Ramaphosa from South Africa. We've seen that with President Kenyatta from Kenya in the just, you know, recently finished um, generation equality meeting, making very strong commitments around addressing gender-based violence. In fact, I remember the president of South Africa actually called it the second epidemic, gender-based violence in South Africa. And so that kind of leadership could be able to really, really work towards um, changing the situations on the ground. You, you talked about structures and leadership. I mean, something that I've been made aware of is that, um, well, I was aware of protests in Kenya because of lack of availability of, of HIV treatments. The people who had been on treatments, you know, the, the supply chain had been interrupted and they were no longer able to access this treatment. Has that been resolved now? So, uh, yes and no. So on paper, we did get um, a public announcement by the National AIDS Control Council that the issue has been resolved. But remember, we have been getting these announcements over time for the last almost four or five months. Um, there's an issue, then it's resolved. So it remains unclear exactly what's going on between that's creating this impasse between, you know, USID and, and the government of Kenya. Initially, it was about taxation and levies um, that ensure that was making the, the treatment and prevention commodities stuck at the port. But then increasingly, it became about USID wanting to distribute the, the commodities on their own through their own mechanisms because the system that you know distributes 
drugs and treatment in Kenya, um, they deemed it corrupt and they, they deemed the system to have, be having issues. So this um, push and pull has been going on, but it's resulted in people living with HIV, you know, some reporting that they are getting expired treatment, some not getting treatment as they did before. Remember, we have progressed. And one of the things that has enabled us, people living with HIV, to remain on treatment, then be adherent, and then you know get to viral suppression has been the fact that our lives have not, for a while, been centered around going to the health facility. And so at a time when there's restrictions, there's lockdowns, partial aid entries, and, and, you know, and people are moving up and down, people are losing jobs, and increasingly being in difficult situations where they cannot be able to make frequent travels and visits to the hospital. Plus, people are scared. I mean, it's, it's, there's COVID, and you don't want to get into public transport. You don't want to be within and around the health facility all the time. So the fear has been because we are not getting as much. I mean, previously, we would get three teams or six teams for, for treatment for three months or six months. And now you get for two weeks at a time. So it means you're frequently going to the health facility. Some people will, will drop off, which is worrying, which is very worrying. Florence, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. I really, um, I'm, it, it's been quite difficult to hear how treatment is treatment's been interrupted for you. So I wish you and all of your your your, your compatriots the very best. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks Thank for coming you so on, much. Florence. Thank you. Bye. So has there been anything on the news that's caught your eye recently? There's, there's been a lot, but there, there was a story which we just published on AIDS Map today, which was talking about perceptions of living with HIV uh, from, it was, it was a Dutch study and it was perceptions of HIV negative gain by sexual men. Um, and it was interesting because they looked at how HIV was perceived by people living with the virus and, and how it was perceived by people who didn't. And the perceptions of what it must be like to live with HIV was so much worse coming from people who had never tested or who had tested negative than the, the actual lived experience was of people living with HIV. Now, I mean, obviously, this is one of the things which I kind of bang on about the whole time. I'm always like kind of posting these like really self-indulgent gym selfies and all that saying, yay, it's okay and it's fine. And it is fine in part because I have uninterrupted access to treatment and obviously that makes my life much easier. But I think there is another issue is that I think it is, well, one, I think it's really important. I do say you can survive and thrive, you know, not me personally, but people like me who are able to put that message out because actually when people think that HIV is the worst thing ever, they're going to be less likely to test. And if they're less likely to test, they're less likely to be diagnosed. And that's how this virus perpetuates itself by people who don't know their status, continuing to uh, pass it on, but also risking their own health. So it's really important that we smash that stigma, that we actually take, say, what living with HIV is like now, because that's ultimately it's how we end the epidemic. Mm. But enough of me. Let's get our next guest on. It's Mark S. King. <laughs> Hello. Mark. Hi, Hello. Hello. Hi, Matthew. Hi, Mark. It's so wonderful to hear you. And I say that because the last time you were on the show, we couldn't hear each other. And you were I know. so brilliant. But You're you know, it gave me the perfect opportunity to just go on my way and give you a five minute soliloquy, <laughs> yeah. um, which I'll probably do again. <laughs> but, I went to have um, a cup of tea, it was fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, now, hello. Now, so, so you, I mean, two, day, two days ago, it, we passed the 40th anniversary of the first New York Times report on AIDS. It was that kind of 40 homosexuals have have uh, had this rare form of cancer mm -hmm. and you know kind of what's all this about um and I, I guess it makes me think about aids the history of aids and and how it's remembered and recorded so i mean you you've been obviously diagnosed for a long time and you've been very vocal and active but do you think that the history that we have of aids is an accurate and a fair one? 
I think that it's still in process. And I think that we all have a part to play to make sure that that history is correct. Um, HIV history it will never be accurate as long as it is incomplete. And uh, what we are seeing is uh, what happens in, in our culture, which is mass media kind of produces the low hanging fruit. Oh, what was AIDS like in New York City? Oh, what was AIDS like in London? Right. We have great examples of art that focuses on those communities. But the fact is, is that there's all sorts of people that live in those smaller cities and second tier cities and third tier cities um, who were doing um, having great experiences and doing a lot of great work and seeing a lot of tragedy. Um, but we haven't heard their stories and uh, something that actually I'm really. Um, big on right now is the idea that all of us have a have a role to play to make sure that we fill in the blanks of our of, of HIV history because because pretty soon you know like you say it's been 40 years historians are going to take a look and go well I guess this is the way it was that that the the chronicle that we have at our disposal you do not have to have a book agent or a film crew to chronicle your story of living with HIV or what has happened to you as someone with HIV or as an ally. You can record it on your phone and send it to an archive. You can uh, write a blog post and submit it to an organization who will, who will archive it. Um, there's so many new media ways that you can do it. I want to encourage anybody who has experienced these 40 years or 30 years to get on a Zoom call with some of their friends who might have also been there and record it and just start talking about what happens. And uh, believe me, that's valuable. That's really valuable narratives that somebody is going to want to have. And then you just email it to them and you can get on with your life. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you recently turned 60 and had Alton John sing at your virtual birthday party. Um, yes, ma'am, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. but when you were diagnosed with HIV, did you actually think that you would live to see 60? Well, I, I just got to tell you that the perks just keep coming. <laughs> you know, um, here we have, you're, you know, you're right, Elton uh, and uh, his uh, wonderful husband, David, uh, uh, made an appearance on my 60th birthday. It was, a, it was a virtual event to raise money, of course. It was a fundraiser. And, um, and I was really uh, very, very... Uh, I don't even know how to describe it. Did I know I would see 60? No. You know, it's interesting because it's almost, you know, I kind of lucked out in terms of when I was born, I guess, in that I was coming of age just as HIV was reaching the scene. I was sexual, I was in my early 20s when it started happening, and I lived in, in West Hollywood. And so I've kind of straddled this history, right, of AIDS as, as we've gone along. And it gives me a lot of time to think about that in terms of, I guess for a while there, I did have hopes that I would see both ends. I would see the beginning and I would see the end. And I, I don't think that that's uh, any longer a realistic expectation. Um, and I'm okay with that because what I am gonna be able to, how I am gonna be able to contribute long-term survivors like, you know, like us, is um, they're going to learn from me and they're going to learn things from me in terms of, you know, what, what, what is the long term effects of all of these uh, medications that we're taking? Do we are we going to have problems with bone density? Am I going to die of heart disease early or not? All of these questions, a lot of questions are going to be answered. And you know what? They've been asking questions of my generation, my cohort since the beginning, right? Oh, what, what happens when we give them this drug? What happens when they've been on drugs a long time? Oh, it looks like they're going to live. I wonder how long. You know, we've been just studied the whole time. And I guess I will go out that way, you know. And however I do, um, I will leave behind information that will help the next person. So while, while I may not be here to see the very end, um, I, I will have something to contrib contribute to move along that that ultimate end to AIDS. Mark, you have contributed so much to the, the, the discourse around HIV. I mean, you, if people don't know, Mark has this blog and it's called My Fab, Fabulous Disease or My Fab Disease. My and Fabulous it, Disease. My Fabulous Disease, so look it up. Um, but yeah, he, you, 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 you treat your infection and your history with such 
I mean, it's just, well, it, I, I think there's a, there's a lightness of touch, which I really appreciate because you don't, you know, it's not all kind of, oh, woe is me. You, you know, you called it my fabulous disease and you are upbeat and positive and, you know, and also now you start doing the gym selfies, so I'm in real trouble. Um, but well, what, what, you know, what, what, I, I think this is my third or fourth midlife crisis. And so I'm at the gym doing gym selfies and why not? Why um, not? But what, what, what would be the one, the one bit of your legacy, the one kind of bit of learning or the one message that you would want to share if you had to pick just one i would want to share the fact that uh, as you mentioned earlier we all as a community rose up when we were being asked when we were being asked to stand up and, st and be counted and do something that was frightening we did it and we stood up and we did it and we and we showed up and so there's that the other thing that i think it's important to remember is that as i mature I am more and more kind of joining the whole of humanity. I'm joining other people who are also aging and having very similar issues as me. You know, I got friends that are getting sick and having life-threatening things that have nothing to do with HIV, purely because of the, the age that we are, right? I, I want to use my experience having faced a life-threatening situation through my, much of my life to develop more empathy for other people, to better understand them. And as I age, I feel again myself kind of joining the whole of humanity and being able to have, um, it's not as if I'm walking away from saying I'm no longer AIDS specific. What I'm saying is that age and time and all of these things um, makes us realize that, you know, you were saying um, something about, um, uh, you know, we don't want people to know that AIDS is not the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. Right? Well, that's true. And as bad as it was for me, there are, life is filled with things that are bad. And um, the best that we can do is take, what, take the cards that we are dealt and um, use them to um, help other people. As corny as that sounds, and that's other people who have diabetes or aging or they're lonely or they have other issues that they want to do. That's what I try to turn around and do. And um, it's working for me. And so um, I guess the older I get, the less AIDS centric I am. And the more I am using that AIDS experience um, to um, hopefully navigate life a lot better. Fabulous. Wonderful. Mark, it was so wonderful to actually be able to talk with you. Thank you so you know, much. One of these days, show. Matthew, I'm going to see you in person. You, you know, the 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 the, uh, the the miracle of modern technology. I feel like you're a close friend, and I've never been in the same room with you. Uh, one of these days, that's going to happen. I'm going to give you a big old hug, and um and feel your bicep maybe. And <laughs> take me. My body is ready. <laughs> okay. and, and Susan, I will give you a very very politically correct. Um, a hug, you know, without feeling <laughs> anything. Feel you know, my I mean. biceps too. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you so much for, for the work on. that you're doing. Thank you for the, your show. I've been watching every every uh, episode. Um, I'm so impressed from a technical standpoint, and, and you're lovely, and you're doing a great service. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. That's oh. all we have time for. Ah, I can't believe that we've run out of time so quickly. Thank you so much to our wonderful guests, Jane, Florence and Mark. And thank you to our sponsors, Lloyd's Pharmacy and Theratech. We're not back next week. We are meant to be fortnightly. Last week was an aberration because we had that Pride special. So it will be back in a fortnight's time. So see you then, everyone. Bye. See you then.